Thank you very much. So we'll see Stuart tomorrow. And uh, with no further delay, I invite Andrus Grigorievas to stage. And I don't know how to introduce him. He's like a hum human seeing through all of the different things that are happening and the trends that are happening. And he's going to talk about the gaming industry and what communicators can learn from it. Give it up to Andrus. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that was a blatant lie. I'm not going to say anything remotely useful or relevant to any of you. Um, <laughs> I mean, if it's. So yeah, if that's out of the way, we already lost two people. Um, um, I was kind of thinking, how do I come up with the reason to talk about games? I, I've been trying to to sell games-related topic for quite some time. It's not like it's my first attempt. <laughs> Uh, but I got slightly better at it. I mean, nobody's going to buy a gaming topic for a serious conference. Uh, so I decided I should do some framing, you know, the old-fashioned framing. So I say, here's two topics I can give you. The one sounds, everyone's incompetent, and the, uh, the other one is about games. So today here I'm talking about games. So that's cool. That worked for me, at least. Uh, so I know that really framing works in practice. Um, I work as a strategist, uh, so this is my rational explanation. Why do you think, why should we even bother ourselves with talking about games? Because if I ask the question, do you game, um, most probably some of you would raise your hands. Uh, but then I would ask a question, do you game like mobile games? You would say yes, and I say that's not the kind of games I will be talking about. So we kind of omit the question, we're not even starting that discussion. Um, I, since I work as a strategist, in most of the cases what happens, you have a strategic case, you start working with the business, and the very first thing you do, you start benchmarking against others in the same industry. It's a very common practice, it means, so who's else in the same business as we are, what are those people doing, what kind of you know, marketing stacks do they have, what kind of PR messages are they sending out. People start benchmarking against other competition in the same area, what happens next is, um, they just start copying the same principles, the same best practices, and nothing interesting happens in the end. Because you all, everything you can see is just all the evidence is around you. So it usually starts with benchmarking. Every strategic case is a very sad one if it ends with benchmarking against the competition in the same industry. What usually, it's still good that we don't have these, I mean, awards for template thinking, or uh, the best use of best practices. Like, here's a reward. Like, we have an international award session. The best application of the best practice that was introduced the year before goes to... And you have a brand. So let's say you had a Nike example, right? Next year, we're going to have an award for the best template practice for anyone who's, who will be imitating Nike, especially after they gain some awards. We're going to have multiple template types of campaigns who do the same thing. Uh, splatter on inspirational text on a black and white photo. So, what happens, what's the other stuff that we can do apart from benchmarking from all the other people who are in the same industry doing the same things is kind of look for analogy, saying maybe somebody else in other industries have the same problem as we do, maybe we can take a look at them, find the solution that they're applying, or maybe understand the mechanics behind it, and take the same principles and apply it to our daily life. We say that learning by analogy, and analogy is something that, something that we are not doing, something, the industry that we are not in. Uh, let's take a very simple, a quick case, employer branding. Uh, everybody's talking how it's difficult to attract talent, how young people are different from uh, other generations, how we struggle to create the right reputation, the image, and to reduce the cost that we spend on a single person who comes to interview and leaves within the first five minutes. And you ask the question, okay, so how do we build the employer brand? You start looking at other companies in your own industry, you start benchmarking, you see what social media channels they're using, and you start just basically copying to uh, maybe to a lesser extent the things they are doing or have been doing for a longer time, which is not exactly a recipe for success. Uh, there was no, also no award given for a moderate success in a certain area. So what happens, you can ask the question, who has the biggest challenge in employer branding? Who historically always had the biggest challenge in employer branding? Who had the biggest uh, barriers to attracting talent for maybe a job that nobody else wanted? 
So it's who that might, might possibly be. It might be. Yeah, it could be that. Uh, we could even be more drastic about this. I mean, it's any kind of job where you can die. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Uh, we offer good remuneration for your family. <laughs> That's in case of accidental guaranteed death. So you take, you take it to the army. You take it to the marines. They have the best employer branding practices from all the industries that we could possibly see right now. Not telecommunications, not banking, not B2B services, it's the army. And they're doing beautiful things. They have some of the best advertising campaigns. They have some of the best social media campaigns and content marketing strategies. You can actually just copy paste all the marketing hacks and tricks and mechanics from them and you have a beautiful employer branding approach. Not all of them will work for you and for your industry, but most of the lessons that have been learned 20, 30 years ago are already there. You just have to find the industry has faces the same problem. So, if we're developing by analogy, now gaming comes in mind. Why I'm particularly inclined to talk about gaming, there's a re reason for it. It's one of the biggest and the most developing industries in the world. It's three times bigger than the movie industry already. If we're talking about esports, esports is going to take, overtake traditional sports. And when I say traditional, I don't mean chess. <laughs> By 2020. And game is the ultimate medium. It has actors, it has music, it has cinematics, it encompasses all the other forms of art. It's basically, I like it. That's <laughs> the short, short version of it. Uh, but the problem we have, since I, since I teach international brand management, I also teach at uh, uh, executive MBA programs. Uh, the problem I have with everything we have in marketing is that it basically, everything we do, uh, the books, the textbook we have, everything is based on the, what I say, the corpse of old school brands. Every single communication theory has its roots in a traditional brand that have no relevance today. I mean, why should we be talking about branding theories based on Heinz ketchup? When was the last time you've been excited about the Heinz? And we still, if we go back to the theories that we use, to the communication frameworks we have, to the purchase funnels we apply every day, it's still freaking Heinz. It's nothing less, nothing more. All the traditional FMCG brands. Now, if there is still a person in the room who believes that the future belongs to FMCG, I'm really sorry for them. So, getting back to the gaming industry. Gaming industry has lots of lessons. It's one of the biggest ones. It's one of the most complicated industries out there. It has beautiful solutions, beautiful problems. There's a lot to learn. And it's one of the industries that nobody likes to talk about. It's one of the things that everybody kind of, oh, it's one topic that's, you know, it's for kids, it's for younger people. Maybe it's for people who don't have jobs. Maybe that one being true, but uh, the industry is changing, and it's changing in two ways. It's the content complexity, which means the product is changing itself. So the games that we have now have nothing to do with the games probably you tried before. That has changed a lot. Infrastructure complexity, by which I mean that the industry itself, how it's being marketed, how the games are created, how the companies work, interact, what are the marketing stacks and the tools they use, also are enormously complex. And they're solving much more complex problems than the rest of the industry. So what you're saying is simple things. Maybe we can learn a thing or two about them and from them. Just to regard the first case, uh, this is the tiny educational bit. Just uh, for me to catch my breath, I also inserted a few videos for a few minutes. Uh, there are a few things that are changing. Um, storytelling complexity means that video games are more complex in the stories they tell than ever before. I'll have a few examples to back it up. They're also immensely complex sometimes requiring up to 120 hours even to master the basic techniques of how to win a single game. It's 120 hours of your immediate attention just to crack the basic mechanics of a game. And also a game is the best, um, I think, deterrent for anyone saying, oh, look, humans now have attention, uh, attention uh, reduction span, deficiency span, They're like three seconds and we're like, oh, look, squirrel. Yeah, there are people dying from playing games for three days or watching Netflix for, Netflix for you know, two weeks. I don't, call, <laughs> I, I don't call that attention deficiency. 
disorder. I think they're very much attentive to the thing they're seeing in front of their faces. Um, so there's mechanical complexity, there's graphical complexity, of course. Games are evolving, they look much better. Sometimes it's even hard to discern what you see at cinematics or what you're seeing in game. Um, just to prove it, a few, I have a few examples, uh, a few trailers, just to look at what happened. Uh, one of them is God of War, it's just a recent game, who's most probably going to win the Game of the War, uh, Year Award. Uh, just to showcase that one particularly, it was a game about a Greek god who, uh, the storyline, like, uh, there's an angry Greek god who murders all other Greek gods. That was the, that was one line. It was really successful, lots of people loved it. I mean, what's not to love about it? Um, <laughs> But a sequel comes out after quite some time, a gap. And this time about, it's the same angry Greek god, but with the kid, and it's about, basically it's a story about fatherhood. There do I see my mother. Oh, there do I see my father. Oh, there do they call to me. Oh, there do they call to me. Oh, there do they call to me. That bow is a little big for you, isn't it? My mother made it for me. Said I'd grow into it. Find your way home. You are free. We're taking our ashes to the highest peak in the realms. Ashes? It was our last wish. Where must we go? To a realm beyond your own. There's only one person who can get you where you need to go. They call me Mamiya, smartest man alive. First, you need to cut off my head. Wait, what? That axe you got. You got a handle or special. I know you're a god. Not of this realm, but there's no mistaking it. He doesn't know, does he? About your true nature or his own? The longer you wait, the more damage you do. He will resent you, and you may lose him forever. You're next! I'll rip your head off! There are consequences to killing a god! Why? How do you know? How do you know? Power. This weapon, any weapon, comes from here. But only when tempered by this. By the discipline. The self-control of the one who wields it. Open the door! We need your help! This is no ordinary illness. The boy's true nature, your true nature, fights within him. So I'm a man now. Like you? No. We are not men. We are more than that. The responsibility is far greater. something that big? So, you see the production in a game like this is parallel. Pre-order, get three shield skins for in. <laughs> yeah, that's a little promo back there at the end. Um, equals a blockbuster movie. It's a 30 hour, 30 plus hour game, and it's all uh, it's all kind of, we can call it filmed, presented in one, in a single shot. It means for 30 hours you see a movie that doesn't black out, doesn't stop, doesn't waver, it always follows you. There's one single camera shot that's always there. It's 30 hour movie, um, and it's about fatherhood, it's about the relationship between a boy and a, and a Greek god who murders other gods. This one... Uh, Before you have a chance. a part of who you are. Her world changed that day when the North Wind took him from her. Senua knows that there is no going back to how things were. 
that there is nothing to go back to at all. Stay still, stay quiet, hide, and don't turn around. Their gods can see into your mind. They will use this power to destroy you. They won't stop me. I can still feel him. Whatever's left of him, they will never let him go. I'm not gonna let him rot here. You're the one rotting here. Leave me alone. You will die here. No. And all your suffering will have been for nothing. Shut up! So this is uh, this is the one that came out this year. This is the first game, triple A game, to explore mental illness and schizophrenia on this format. So it's about it's about a woman who suffers from uh, multiple voices, uh, schizophrenic episodes, and it's a triple A game. So it means that it's a mainstream title. It's not your indie title that you see in some remote uh, film festival, and it's a game. So this is this is just to prove the point of how long. Uh, did the games go from being something that looks like Super Mario, so a thing that everybody knows, to something that looks like this. Uh, but the point that I want to make is that even though the content has evolved, uh, I think the interesting bit for us as specialists is not only how the games are created, what the content is presented, but how the industry has developed its own set of tools and practices to solve specific challenges. That's, that's the interesting bit. It's really, I don't have enough time to delve into everything, but I kind of tried to point out at least the interesting directions that we could uh, supposedly investigate on our own. And I have six reasons of why gaming industry has a lot of, to teach every single one of us. Uh, the first being is positioning. Positioning lessons, I would say like the positioning and marketing textbooks really have to be rewritten from, the, from day one, just for a simple reason that the most expensive positioning lessons are in the history of gaming. Um, the biggest debacle, the biggest positioning debacle was when Xbox and PlayStation 4, the two newest consoles, it's like the little boxes that you put in your homes to play games, uh, launched. And technically those two were exactly the same products. Xbox has a had the same product as PlayStation 4, even had half the games which were the same. So it means no technological superiority to any of the products. But the difference being that the Xbox launched as Entertainment Center, uh, with the simple message being that you can, this covers all your entertainment needs. You can watch videos, you can watch, you can listen to music, you can connect, you can dance around with the Kinect, etc. Do all the stuff, funny, fun stuff that you can do with your families, and not only play games. When Haven PlayStation 4 launched at the same time, exactly had the keynotes and the presentations, and they said a very simple message. It's the best place to uh, play games. What happened, uh, the market really kind of got lost with the entertainment center message, which kind of forgot the core essence that actually it's for gamers, so gamers would like to play games. The rest is nice to have, but not a key feature. And we don't really don't want to be spending 60 uh, 60, let's say, euros or dollars every month for a new game just to share with, with the rest of the family of the same TV set. So that's the entertainment center debacle as a positioning uh, kind of um, lesson uh, was there for Xbox for the upcoming four years. And it had a huge impact. Xbox never caught up with the market they had. They actually had to spend two years just to fix the launch marketing mistake on positioning themselves in a very wrong way and disowning their own core crowd. If you don't tell the gamers why it's good coming back to the same console, they lost. And since after those two lessons have come to pass, everyone's thinking, okay, so there's not, not much space left for any third console to be there in the first place. Uh, the only product that could succeed in a market like that was a product that was technologically superior, could play better games, have better graphics. And here comes Nintendo, with Nintendo Switch, which just lost recently, a year ago, and said, anywhere, anytime. It was a hybrid console that you could take poor games with poor execution and poor graphics, but you could play them anywhere. And it's proven to be the best success in the recent four years, in the last four years. So, I mean, there's lots of details to this campaign and positioning. I, this only asks as a reminder that we can find a lot of things in the industry that really has a huge money behind it and has some of the most engrossing and interesting positioning details to tell. 
And the uh, gaming industry always kind of proves the point that value is always context dependent. So it means that at some point, let's say the same year, could have a trend of narrative heavy games. Just after six months, you have games that have zero narrative and succeed uh, hugely in a market. You can have g simple mechanic games being replaced by complex system games. You can have entry difficulty replaced by impossible challenge games. I'll talk about some of these in a, uh, in a second. But what it means when you have industry this uh, huge that is developing at such high rates, in a course of six months, you can see the developments you could only see in six years in other industries. And that's really exciting to watch. It's like a super accelerated area that gives you lots of insights about how products work, how market works, and how brands work. But you don't have to, you know, to wait another 25 years for Apple to fail just to say, look, I told you. Extended product life cycle. Um, this one is interesting because uh, I think the gaming industry managed to crack one thing. They had the core product and they managed to expand it both ways, which means to build around it to create something that's no longer a product but a service. They added, so imagine this, you buy a product for $60, uh, but then what the company says, you'll be receiving extra content packs, DLC packs that extend the story, extend the gameplay, and you start paying for those as well. But then you have Game of the Year edition, which also adds extra captures the additional segments in the market. Then you have the remastered edition, which improves upon those features. Even before the game launches, you usually have limited showcases, you have closed and open betas, you have green light and the early access, just to capture the audience, just to sell the initial copies. What happens with the gaming? is that games are extremely good at selling the concept even before they have anything done and extremely good at moving from product to service. Now, every single product in the gaming industry is service-based. It means that... Sorry, I heard that sound. <laughs> like, <laughs> shit. <laughs> um, what they moved away from is a concept that we only sell the product to the concept of what we sell is we sell the active player community and that's part of the promise that we'll be able to sell you a product that has active player base for a long time. They're also selling the content and the promise that the content is going to be evolving and they're selling the support that comes in form of different variety of features that the, the, the game uh, companies produce over the support time. So this is, this is what happens with games. Games are no longer selling something, they're selling an evolving service that changes over time. So it means for me, as a player, playing a game now versus playing a game six months after is an entirely different experience. Which works for me as a simple heuristic. If it's not the same game I will be playing, most probably I should play it now and continue playing for the upcoming six months, be a part of that changing, evolving product. And that's... That's something that everybody talks, the holistic product concept. It's, it's, it's kind of, you find in any marketing conference, actually, who managed to pull it off? Not so many. I guess that's the only industry who actually has capitalized on it. The product development side. Gaming is the fastest of the developing industries, and a clear, clear reason for that. Uh, the innovation in gaming companies doesn't happen here. This is not your usually innovation hub, where you have cookies and nice coffee, where you put some nice people. Uh, nine to six, uh, they have a few ideas, throw it around the board, says, yeah, that's, that sounds cute, maybe let's do it next year. <laughs> the innovation funnel for a, pro, for a, for a game producer is, looks like this, 400 ideas, 20 accepted for review, one implemented. Which means in every single, single part of the funnel, you have 5% conversion. But in order to have something, it's like you said, NHR, I would say, in order to get the best possible candidate for us, uh, so we won't pick the best one from three people that come into the interview, right? We need 200 to get to, to pick a really prospective person who's going to stay with us, with the company, will, would actually adhere to the values we have and, and, uh, and produce some, some noticeable results. The same thing happens here. This is the innovation follows. It's 400 ideas in six months, 400 concepts to get that one that everybody believes in. That's a 5% conversion just to get it reviewed and a 5% conversion from reviewed items to the ones implemented. So it's not three people coming to an interview. Uh, the gaming industry was the first one to embrace and understand the value of value propositions. That sounds ridiculous, but that's what it is. Um, saying that if we have one notion, one, one phrase that kind of says what's the company, what's the value for us, 
what's the value for user, how the marketing can exploit it, and how can the sales use it to sell something. And they, let's say, they have the word, the game Stellaris, they have one phrase, the universe is vastly full of wonders. This is what they use for internal development, this is what gaming companies use for marketing and for sales, and this is what they communicate as value to the users. One single proposition, it can be deflected and can be segmented into four different approaches to four different areas of the company development. Or let's say this one, this is my favorite, I, I think I spent like 600, 600 hours on this one. Uh, the proposition that they had was prepared to die. It was the first game that said, look, uh, it's not going to be easy, you're going to die lots of times, and when you die, you lose everything you had. So you have, usually have to start from scratch. It it's, has been a phenomenal uh, run for the Dark Souls series. It's a game made by the Japanese interpreting Western culture. And it's extremely, extremely interesting interpretation. It has spawned numerous books, uh, academic studies. I think there's even a scholarship named in that. You can get some money just to research the topics in this game. Managing communities. You, we spoke a lot about influencers, but I think they, what the gaming industry knows best is how to work with them. I mean, we're only scratching the surface with how to deal with influencers. And usually what we do is we do these single tactical actions, just sending samples to someone, paying somebody for a post. It has no system, it has no coherence, and it, it has a despicably low impact on everything, on the general marketing outcomes. Uh, gaming industry for a long time has a single purpose and a single idea, just make it easy for us to add value to what we create. Not a single game can actually pull it off without the community. That's a given. I mean, it's not something that anybody can walk around. Parties involved. You already had something similar. For, for the games, it's streamers. These are people who stream the way the game. Uh, and these are different from content creators. These are the people who create the content, but they're usually not streamers. If you're a content creator, most probably you're a poor streamer. If you're a streamer, you're not as good as, at creating content. So you need two groups. Then you have Redditors who manage the Reddits. Uh, you have community managers, wiki pa pa page managers. And then at last and finally, you have only, then you have the journalist. And most probably you can, you shouldn't care too much about journalists because if you get the first ones right, the journalists usually come by themselves. Um, what the gaming industry is working to give all these people the tools to maintain the relationships, to provide access and as much access over a course of time so that could engage this community. Different mechanics to it, but they have the tools, relationships, and the KPIs to make this work. Um, going back to the Dark Souls franchise, the interesting bit about that was this was the game. Uh, there's no longer metrics on YouTube, but in the last time I was checking it a year ago, the Dark Souls series had more lore videos. You know what lore is. It's like a history of the world that the game is set on. So let's say if you're into Star Wars, you would want, you want to know more about the characters to find out what, uh, what, that was, what planet with ice was about. So you look it up, you type in Star Wars or Lord of the Rings lore, and you get videos with content on that specific character, place, or uh, event. Dark Souls, this one game you never heard of, had a year ago more lore videos than Lord of the Rings, Star Wars combined. There were more people interested in creating content, YouTube content for this game, the single game you haven't heard of, than those two franchises, mega franchises, with books, comic books, graphic novels, movies, and musical soundtracks. What's not? It had more of them. There are even people, like the first one you have to see, this Vati Vidya, uh, who is actually earning money and living from creating uh, videos on lore for the single game. There are already five books uh, around this topic. How did they achieve that? They actually had no story in the game whatsoever. What they did, they, even though it kind of looks like a hack and slash game, they put all the descriptions in, uh, all the story into item descriptions. So it means you pick up an item like a nice word that you can hack skeletons with, and it has a tidbit of story like this here. And there are thousands of items all over the place. There are different sculptures, different places. You can reconstruct the story, but the story is not given to you. What happens when you create an open text, people come flooding. They start recreating, they start structuring, they start creating the histories, they start creating Wikipedia pages, and you have enormous flood of content that has kept this game alive for a very long time. 
just because it decided not to tell a story, not to feed it to you, but rather have this in a detective mode where you have to piece everything together. Once again, when we come back to the topic of attention span, that clearly proves that we don't have any problems here. So, it's a game that has its own lore scholars. Some of them are getting scholarships from universities that produce content ranging from videos to books. That's nice, right? Sounds a bit postmodern, but that's, that's the world we live in. Uh, a simple thing is a photo mode. Give the players the ability to have the photo mode in the game, produce photos, share them. Give them a tool. Actually, it has enormous impact on any game. Every single game now has a photo mode just for the people to share the moments they had in game, to compose their own photos after, uh, on, based on the events that happened in the game. Uh, this one's uh, fine. This is an indie game. Uh, as you can see, it has its, uh, specific retro stylistics. Didn't have a lot of money. It was from indie, uh, in independent developer. Uh, what they did was this. They didn't have any money for buying off influencers, right? So their strategy actually is this one paragraph here. We started off with the streamers with uh, uh, zero to five concurrent, view uh, concurrent viewers. So it means not a lot. It's basically you stream a video, no one watches. So they started with those guys on, uh, on Twitch. Then 5 to 25 concurrence, then 25 to 100, 100 to 1,000. And that happened progressively over three months with the demo version. About two or three weeks before launch, we were pitching the full version of the game to all top tier YouTube and Twitch guys with an embargo. By the time those tier 1 and tier 2 influencers were playing it, they already seen the guys we had previously playing the demo, and a lot had sent us the code request. They had spent zero money on the top influencers in their field just because they chronologically onboarded every single other streamers in the market. This is, this is the influencer strategy right there. This is a very nice, this is a very neat mechanic. Just basically you get the top paid once by first getting consecutively higher rate influencers in the market. In this case the streamers, but let's say if you're selling a croissant, I guess that would work in the same way. Engagement mechanics, I'll be so over soon. Uh, games, are really, games really have cracked humans. What I mean by these games really understand how to keep people engaged and to die from malnutrition in front of a screen. I mean, if, if they have the key, I mean, every single one of us, how do we engage people into internal communications? How do we make them care about our internal values? This, this is the problem everybody has. Yeah. Motivational systems. The games have really cracked how to keep people coming. So let's say Fortnite, the most popular game in the world. Uh, they have a system that, let's say, they have a tiers when they incentivize you to come back for every single day to earn rewards and to multiply those rewards over time. Um, it's something similar as an Airbnb host status would work. It's really easy to get it, but once you get it, you're kind of inclined to keep it. But to keep it means lots of diff difficult words. If once you're a super host and you get that status, keeping it is an obligation that requires lots of time. Let's say answering within an hour. But since you already have the sunk cost effect, you got the special status, you're more inclined to keep on that performance even though it means more work in the future that it really meant on getting that. The same, the same principles apply to games. Unlockables, customization options, daily rewards, season resets, challenges and events, we could actually have a different presentation on each of these items because these are motivational engagement mechanisms. We work for people and keep them coming back. Why do you think it's relevant? Because you have those, you have young people coming in after two weeks saying, Hey, I want a raise, I want a promotion, I think I'm doing fine. What can you tell me about my performance? Where's my feedback? Where's my feedback again? Why are you so silent? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm changing my job now. It's in three months. So, if you ask the questions, so these are young people. They are used to different things than we are. They, most of they played more Fortnite than we did. Uh, most of they are better at than we are. Instant gratification and swift progress, exactly the same things we're looking answers to and the gaming industry already has them. The same principles, we go back, play a game, try to understand what keeps you coming back and there will be things that keep you coming out unless you keep dying every five minutes. And we say it's a lousy game, but no. And we apply them, we transpose the same principles. And the last one to finish this off is user experience, user, uh, user design questions. 
Games have the guys highest information density, most complicated information structures, the hierarchies. So basically, they're solving e-commerce problems, but for a different reasons. They're looking for different ways to group things, to present them in the menus. Uh, there's a very nice talk about this, the Destiny UX design. It's an hour long, and it actually goes from all the innovation that has been implemented in a single menu. If you're really into experience design, user design, user interface design, you should definitely watch it. There will be lots of principles and lessons to pick out from there. Because the, the complication about game interface design is you have to have tons of information cramped in a little screen, and you have to make it easy to navigate. This actually sounds like shopping for new clothes on an online store, <laughs> when you come think about it. So, if you want to understand how that works, you have to look it up. So, six reasons why the games could be interesting to anyone of us and we can benefit from it. So, say positioning lessons. If you want to understand marketing, let's take a look. Extended product life cycle. How did they achieve that over the course of 10 years? How did they get from the product to a service? How did they manage to convince everyone that there is no single benefit to owning a product but actually buying a service? Product development lessons. How do you do it? How do they use value propositions? How do you communicate it internally? How do they get people aligned on the same core principle? Communicate it in marketing and sales and get the message out to consumers. A message that actually no one is really successful at. You can say what you want, but sales and marketing and uh, management is like three, three top pillars that never meet in the same, under the same building. Managing communities, which basically we can talk influencers here. All the lessons, all the good lessons, I mean, uh, are there, not someplace else. Engagement mechanics, how to keep people coming, how to keep them engaged, how to reward them, what are the different ways, what are the different formats and styles of doing that. And the last one, if you're into design and design decisions, it's also quite a lot to learn from. So, um, what I wanted to say today is I really like playing games. Thank you. <laughs>
complementary support for non-immersive experience or for another immersive experience. You know, the point of internal communication isn't to completely leave employees absorb, uh, absorbed in their internal communication, but to leave them absorbed in doing what it is that they're being paid to do. Um, that's a good point, uh, I think, but uh, I mean, in, uh, you have to, anyways, to to make people immersed in their work, to believe what they, in, in the things they have to do and believe a shared set of values, you have to make them explore those values, internalize those values, uh, somehow experience those values directly instead of just being shown a PowerPoint presentation that this is what our company stands for. Uh, and we are entrepreneurial, we are creative, innovative, efficient, and friendly. And we rely on teamwork. That's usually the standard uh, corporate presentation. But then you ask the question, so how do you go beyond that? How do we make people go through these things, internalize at least some of them, and start believing and acting upon them in their everyday work? And I think this is the part where the gaming lessons might come in and actually help internal communications. Of course, it's not something you would use and scale entirely throughout the organization. Though some of those, especially when talking about engagement mechanics, uh, are uh, simple lessons that could be applied especially to young employee motivation because we definitely know that in three months period we already have to give them something in form of feedback, in form of appraisal, something that's even that tiny but shows the progress within the organization. If we used to spend five years without any, anybody noticing what we're doing in, inside a, a company, they spent just two weeks asking for some sort of swift, instant, even small gratification. And if we devise those systems and put them in place, so that doesn't, doesn't mean that we're breaking the efficiency cycle, but it is we kind of, um, we answering their essential need of feeling a progress in organization and feeling kind of a, at least an emotional reward for the things they're doing. Because they, I think they're kind of used to getting that elsewhere. So it's about making the work experience more immersive, but also increasing the speed and the resonance of recognition and feedback in a way that mirrors what you see in the, in the virtual world rather than the traditional world. Yes. Okay. No, let's let's that. Fantastic is the word I would like to finish this off. Thank you very much, Andres, and uh, let's give a final round of applause. Thanks for everyone. And thanks to everyone who survived until up till now. And let's go grab a drink now. <laughs> Thank you.